Hello, I'm Chris Athenis. I'm a KMP developer. Today we're going to continue our series on how to program from the ground up. Ooh, we're getting to the meaty stuff. There's going to be a little bump up in, uh, oh, a bump up in uh, complexity. Some like, uh, seemingly, like lots of new words and phrases and stuff. Oh yeah, text port's coming out Tuesday, so hopefully that'll get closed soon. Um, we're going to follow along the guide here. Uh, Class-oriented programming style, 1970s to present. To present. This is kind of a long section. Honestly, I tried to keep it as just to the stuff that was like confusing to me and can like kind of like, what are you guys talking about? Um, so I kind of want to go over that. And uh, so here, here we are with class rated programming. So we're going to be talking about C++ mostly or in the C++ style. I don't have a lot of C++ code in here. I'm using the pseudo code because the syntax, I don't think is important to, to know unless you want to go become a C++ programmer for what if you for the reasons which will the reasons for, there's good reasons for C++ but in general I say stay away from it <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really loving Kotlin these days because I can do the back end I can do the front end I it uses all these concepts I can use the cop style I can use the boop style which we'll get into but we're going to go over all these diagrams you know what is the simplistic view of the object class paradigm here's the class up here and here's the object that it makes and here's another here's like this is actually how it really works the pointers and everything uh instantiation was just you know creating one of these objects in memory is a struct struct you know, they call it an object it's an object i mean just like a struct of memory like that this has a structure that has just a bunch of primitives and some pointers to some functions no it's an object. It's different. <laughs> they always kind of say it's different. No, it's just an, a, a memory. It's just a memory. It's just memory. Okay. How we look at it and just how we structure it. So this is a way of structuring a program, mostly for simulations. This is, this is what he was doing it for. We'll get into it. And object instance variables. <laughs> this is the memory. You mean the memory? No, it's an instance variable. You mean the memory thing that represents that object? That's all it is. Uh, yeah, so here we're going to get into the problem. Some abuses for this this keyword here, static. Ah, static. It just means one. There's just one. Okay. Wow. You got to make a word static. Why can't you just like singular? Like, whoa, no, we got to have a static. It's more math math words, meaning there's just there's one of them. Okay, that's what it means. There's just one piece of memory that represents that value. Okay. Wow. Static. It's different. <laughs> the guys just like, keep going. That's the different thing. I just heard that so many times. I'm like, are you sure you've been on the same path I've been? Because I've been doing this since I was like seven. I don't have all the words and lingo. I haven't been to all the seminars and everything. But could you explain it? Like, do you want to, do you know what I'm talking about? With memory? Do you know? No. You because you've looked inside the memory. I'm sure, right? I mean. It's not an object in there. <laughs> it's just memory. So a, so a struct is just a, a, a block of memory with pointers to functions? No, it's different. <laughs> it's the same. That's all it is. So we're going to get into that. Ooh, a UML. Ooh, I'm using UML. You have to know the UML language to understand how this works. <laughs> like. I will, I'll explain all the details, like how this diagram goes right into the code here. It's like a one-to-one -one mapping. It's like, oh my God. Inheritance is just such a difficult to understand. It's like such silliness. Subclasses, derived classes. Like, come on, are you serious? This is some silly stuff here, the, how, they, how they explain it. So I, I'll show the diagram and then show the code. And then we have a, like a live code exercise. You can go run it yourself, mess with it, change the names, change the order, mess with it, totally goof with it as much as you want. And we'll go over some videos here and more diagrams about the abstract class. It's an abstract. You mean just like a general like overview class, kind of like the general, with all the things we should have that's going to be part of this thing, like, like, like an interface, kind of like how things plug together. No, it's different. It's an abstract glass. It's like, you mean it's just a plug? It's the same thing as this interface stuff you just showed me? It's the same stuff. This inheritance thing is the same thing over and over and over and over again. No, it's different each time. It's like, no, it's not. It does, it's not. It's the same thing over. Now, how you use it is in diff, it's a whole different thing. It's just how you can structure things. How you can put stuff together. That's all this is doing. 
here and here's a full diagram of how it's all laid out. We'll go into everything, how it all blinks together. <laughs> it's so silly. People make such a big deal about this because it's confusing how they explain it, how Bjorn, but yeah, we'll get into Bjorn. Let's we'll hear from Bjorn in a second. The creator of the language. And he's like, what you think? Okay, the, the diamond pattern. Ugh, it's a diamond, it's a diamond inheritance pattern. No, it's like if you if you can inherit from an animal, a cat. A cat's an animal, right? And you have a dog as an animal. What if you have a cat and dog put those together in the language? What does that even mean? No, it's easy. It's understandable. It's like, no, it's a bad idea. You end up with a cog. What's a cog? I don't know. What sound does it make? <laughs> That's so weird. So we'll go into what that, why that was the left of the language because this Bjorn wants to collect all the ideas from everybody and put it in his little language, right? That's what he's doing. So that's why it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. It may have started at one point back in the 80s. Eh, okay, reasonable. Now it's just like, no. No. And the performance, because these, cause these, these languages are get compiled down and the, there's all these optimizations that they can do now. It's like you're getting 2% more, 3% more maybe for the extra hassle of learning all that crazy crap. No, no. Well, if you want to go down and see, go down to C. Okay, we'll call a thing with a C. Okay, that's that reasonable. A C++? I don't know. I mean, yes, for systems level stuff, but for applications level stuff, Skip it. Just it's not even a matter. You're you're the customers aren't the customers that were probably that me and you were gonna go after aren't gonna care about that two percent. And if you do, you're not gonna be listening to this channel. You've already moved on from this. So uh, we'll get into design patterns. Ooh, design patterns. Ooh, have you heard about the design patterns? The singleton, the abstract, yeah, the abstract factory factory. It's like oh my god. Some of them, okay, you have to have a singleton. You mean like a global variable? No, it's different. <laughs> oh, you mean is this something you have one of, like a static? <laughs> no, it's different. <laughs> heard that some, how many of these goofy computer people have been in it, they just got in it, and they don't realize I've been in it for like 20 years. By the time that I talk, started talking to them, like I was like 18, I'd already been doing it for, what, 10 years at that point? And then, you know, already had published software. Like, like people, these people were like, no, it's different. I'm like, okay, all right. And that's when I heard, when I, so after a while, when I, what I started realizing was when they said it's different, they don't realize what I knew. And I was just trying to put two and two together and they didn't know the other thing. That was really what was going on. And instead of saying, no, I don't know the other thing. What is the other thing you're talking about? They go, it's different because they don't even know what that thing is because they have an idea of what it is. And they have no idea what it is. So that's what this course is about, right? Is to kind of fill in those gaps uh, and uh, like say, well, okay, there's, there's limitations here. Some of these people will just not admit that they don't know things. And that's, it's an ego problem. So some of these people have just been socialized very poorly, <laughs> is my opinion. <laughs> so we're going to listen to Bjarn Sustrup about his language. Um, hello, I'm uh, Bjarne Strostrup. Now, this is what wouldn't you imagine when I <laughs> a language designer <laughs> who's collecting all the ideas from all around the places. And we'll just leave, we'll just go ahead and take that name as well. <laughs> this guy. I'd like to tell a bit about C++, why he, the language looks like it does, and uh, present some of the main techniques that the language was designed to support. Sit up. The talk has three main parts. First, I'll talk a bit about the origins of C++, up, the problems that was uh, originally designed to solve, and uh, the aims I had for Good the design, your pen. and uh, present some of the rules that developed for the design of the language. Next, I'll present the key uh, techniques, programming techniques, that the language supports, and the language features that are there to support that kind of programming. Um, that means things like classes, abstract classes, derived classes, users of class hierarchies, uh, templates, uh, and uh, runtime type identification. And finally, I will present some features uh, specifically designed to support the writing of larger programs, uh, namely namespaces and exception handling. Towards the end, I will look a little bit about how C++ is currently used and how uh, it might be used in the future. I mean, okay, it is a step up from C. 
yes. But people took it way too far over the top. And we're trying to smash together OOP ideas with this stuff. It's like, not, it's a different thing. It's a different idea than the OOP that, that Alan Kay was talking about. My main sort of idea about languages is that a language is someone's response to a set of problems at a given time. Yes, exactly. But the stealing of ideas and, re and renaming and not changing the names is kind of a bad thing, man. Sorry. You caused a lot of confusion. You should have called it something different, but you didn't want to. You wanted to get on the hype wave that Alan was on. So you want to steal a little bit of his thunders. So that's why I'm kind of beefing about this guy a little bit because yes, this stuff has purpose, but he confused a lot of people in the process. And I don't think that's cool. That is a language is there to solve problems rather than um, being an interesting item in its own right. Um, our problems and our understanding of those problems naturally change over time. And as long as a language is a good solution to problems that are faced by real programmers in, in real code, uh, the language will live and the uh, language will grow too. So I understand why, we now understand why he did it, right? Why he kind of maybe stole it because he wanted his language to grow. He wanted people to use his language. This is this guy. Meet the needs of the programmers. Um, the origins of, of C++ uh, goes back uh, a long way. Uh, one of the direct um, courses of C++ was a project I worked on at the University of Cambridge in England where I was working for my PhD. I was uh, studying distributed systems and the distribution of software running on such systems. I built a simulator to, to give me data uh, about such systems. This uh, simulator was written in, in Simula and was, was for the time at least rather a complicated program. I had encountered Simula before but I was very pleasantly surprised when I, when I used Simula there. Uh, not only did it allow me to write my program, it also helped me uh, think about the design of the program, the class concept of Simula, the um, way you could uh, build upon classes, the whole gene mechanism of Simula, all helped me organize my thoughts. Exactly. Very cool stuff, right? That Alan Kay was kind of into and coming from Simula in a different, but in a different angle, but he was talking about something completely different. So there's this language clash. The namespace clashed and it confused everybody. Still to this day, a lot of people are still confused about this. Uh, secondarily. But it was a way to structure an application, to structure your code, so you could like separate everything else. It's not all bunched together. Even with C, Everything could still access everything else. There was no high, like, enforce. You could like say, "Don't do this." You could put it in the comments, but to enforce it in code. So when you have larger teams of people, they don't get any. There's no confusion about the intention of the programmer, right? This is a way of, for us to structure our stuff in a way for it makes sense for us to use. This is the point I am making here. It's not to make the computer work better, it's to make our work easier and the other people on our teams work here easier. To reduce the, the cognitive load so when we make a change in one place it doesn't break everything else. Because that was very common in the C, the C world, is like you just make one little change over here, it'll break everything. So we needed another way up, right? Another level up of abstraction of some of the things like, okay, don't, you can't see that, don't look at that. Unless you're in there, and then you can see everything. But if you're not in there, just 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 it, it calculates the time. Don't worry about how it does it. Just go. I want the time now. Give it back. How it does it inside, you don't you don't care. You don't want to care. I just want the time. I don't want to go through all the bits and network interface, digital protocols. Just give me the time. And that's what we're getting at. Okay. And the whole thing of getting the time is you're not allowed to go in and peek around inside there. It's private. It's hidden. And that's what he was trying to bring up to the thing is like, how do I structure this stuff? So not only do I understand it, but other people will understand it too. So we can create even more complicated programs that did more sophisticated things with more people that with their specialized knowledge and their specialized section to that they do their part. And that's the big idea. The um, debugging that program was, was rather pleasant. The strong type shaking helped me a lot. And, um, uh, Made sure that I didn't the, the type checking means is like if you're going to pass a float to a function that expects a float in C, you can actually pass just an address, right? It's not checking. 
It's like it assumes that you know you're passing a float. If it's you passing an int, program explodes. Why is my program exploding? I'm classing a I'm passing a number to this to this function. Oh, it's not the wrong, it's the wrong type of number. That function expects to see an integer and you're passing a float. Those are very different things. Yes. And it became a pain in the heck to deal with all that stuff. So that was another thing. Was he, he says, like, I need to put very strong type checking in here so we can't do that anymore. Those tricky little fun little things you can do in C because it's basically shorthand for assembler. So that's this is the reason why this was like, okay, this became an issue, right? Because everyone's still writing in C when, before he came along, which was amazing, right? You could do all this stuff. You weren't writing assembly anymore. But then it was like, ooh. So now you see how it's like not really the computer anymore. It's still like want to have access to the computer. Like you want the lower level stuff, but you were trying to move away from all that detail and complexity and trying to get a nail down on things, especially if you have other people writing code. Yeah. Violate my own rules as I had um, built them, uh, made sure that I didn't violate my own rules as I had um, built them into. Right. So that was the whole point. You set up rules and you can't violate them. They're enforced for the language. And that was the thing that C++, C++ brought to C was this high level thing of like, yeah, I, I, I want to enforce these rules because I'm, it's not just me, right? So he was kind of thinking in his own mind, right? Because the programs he was thinking about were very, really large and, you know, 10 to 100,000 lines minimum. Um, and, um, just to contain that level of complexity with just one person, is, it becomes a difficult task. So what he's trying to do as well is like spread out that thing too. So other people know that this is not, you can't just load lo lo this function and then go look at this variable here. No, this is by private. Don't worry about it. And if we would need to worry about it, we'll open an interface. We'll give you an access to it. That was the idea. That was the whole big flipping idea. The, the code is still running the same. Everything's being called and functions in the same. Everything else is the same. But the big idea is hiding everything from everything else, so it's not a big mess. Program in form of classes. Um, actually, my um, the the amount of help I got from the strong type system was somewhat of a surprise to me, because I previously encountered Pascal, and found its strong type checking um, rather counterproductive. Right, because the syntax was a little bit goofy with Pascal. That's why I was like, boop, done. It always seemed to me that uh, the type checking checked some implementation directed set of rules that got in the way of my programs. The difference between Simula and Pascal was that the rules checked by Simula, by and large, was uh, the rules for the user-defined types I had defined for classes. And uh, when the strong type checking found something, it tended to be uh, a violation of my own rules, and uh, I couldn't object too much to that. Right. That's He's just saying it over again, what I just said. It's a way to structure your code so you don't violate your own rules, and at the same time, you're making an environment so you can have larger teams of people work on more complex problems over more different domains. Um, so I got the program written, got debugged, it ran pretty nicely. Unfortunately, I ran into one major snag. The runtime of that program uh, for real runs, as opposed to debugging runs, were uh, rather extraordinary, and I was soaking up my uh, department's uh, computing budget rather fast on our mainframe. So I had to find a way of getting this program to run more efficiently uh, or I would uh, have to leave Cambridge without a PhD. So, what he's saying there is in the pure similarity language of the pure objects, every time you want to go do something, you have to create this object and do everything through the objects. And he was looking for shortcuts so he didn't have to do all that stuff. And it could run on lower power machines because, because or, or, or the same machine, but make this code faster. So, so he took, took some shortcuts. And this is the COP paradigm. These are the shortcuts he took. And the main one is you can't do self-modifying code. In, in, the, in the true Allen K OOP, the code can modify itself and you can do all kinds of very interesting things with that. Uh, and that's why JavaScript and Ruby are, have self-modifying code. You can change anything at runtime, including the whole class hierarchy. So that that was the the key thing and he and he's like no we're not going to work instead of this i think it might have been an interpret i'm not really sure exactly but it was very inefficient and he was like i'm going to cut some corners here because i'm a c programmer right and i know which corners to cut and how this is doing underneath so i can like make c i can kind of turn c into this 
object oriented style. Like, not even it's not class oriented. It's more. It's, it's sorry, my misnomer. I get, I get this mixed up. The name is mixed up too. This class style and simula. I can simulate. I can do that same kind of thing, more way more efficiently because I'm a C programmer. So we basically built this this other compiler on top of C. So you got you have a you write in you write into the code in C plus plus. It compiles down to C. <laughs> so you run in C. You run in a C plus plus to C compiler. That was how it worked. And then you compile the C in just regular old whatever compiler you got, and that becomes your application. So it was a Way to do portable C plus pluses. This is like the semi portable era, right before Java. Yeah, right before Java did this other did a different different style. Same same objective. One code base, multiple CPUs. So that's how he was able to like hijack on top of C. I mean, he leveraged it up. It was cool how he did it, but it's just okay. It's you're still. It's not really what Alan K because this has to be all compiled, right? So you can't change the stuff at runtime. That's the main, one of the main things you actually cannot change the code. You can change pointers of code. You can have all the classes already built up and have all the ones pre-built at compile time. But at runtime, when it's out in the field running, you can't change any of that stuff. At least not directly with the language. It's not built in. There's ways, of course, there's ways of doing all that stuff. But like, it's not built in. Now, there are a couple of <laughs> classical solutions to this problem. Like I could get my own computer. But uh, that wasn't quite feasible because a computer like that cost several million uh, pounds. And I, I certainly didn't have that kind of money. Um, alternatively, I could wait for hardware to get cheaper, but that would have taken at least at least eight years or so. I um, could try and uh, get Simula to run more efficiently, but uh, I had the greatest respect for the people who had designed and implemented Simula, and I knew they were probably better at that job than I was. And anyway, uh, my job was, was not to uh, invent languages or implement Simula. It was to study distributed uh, computing. So in the right, and that should be another clue. Why this thing is so we got so confusing. He wasn't trying to make a language. It kind of got it along the way, but just because of what he wanted to do with it, and he wanted other people to like come from his his mind space because it was a as a way to do, to to maximize the hardware, not maximize people people's way to think about this the hardware. So it was like a step up from see just another just a. Object-oriented flavorings of this of a step up from C. He even called it C with classes. This is what he called it. And a class is just a bunch of memory with some data, right? Some some primitive variables or other structures, and then some pointers to functions that work on that data or call or other stuff in the system. That's it. That's the big idea. And when you're simulating stuff, it makes sense. You know, if you have a you know you have a truck that's a delivery truck, he's gonna you know, pick up a delivery and send, you know, get a delivery. So it's a way to, you know, simulate stuff. You have all these objects, different types, all run around the simulation. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. And you already kind of know what every, everything's going to do ahead of time. That's like the delivery truck doesn't turn into a, <laughs> doesn't turn into a tricycle. With LK stuff, you could do that. And they may, you know, there's really neat things that can happen with that. Um, but in, in general, you know, you kind of already know what you want. You just want the things to run and simulate the thing, please. Not... I want to do this other thing. So he's got some, he's, he's flavoring it for whatever's convenient to make it the maximize this to run as fast as possible on the hardware I given. In the end, I decided to rewrite my simulator in BCPL and run it on a, a research machine that was so uh, poorly supported that uh, the chemists and the astrophysicists that soak up the main machines uh, couldn't use it. Uh, BCPL is uh, a direct answer. So he's complaining about not getting time to run his program. <laughs> of the C language, and is, is a language that uh, makes C look like a very high level language. Um, right, so he makes C look like this, look like the similar stuff. So he was trying to, he was trying, he was going in between, he was a step between the pure OO, OOP style and this, uh, this, this regular low level C. So that's, that was the whole goal. Getting my simulator rewritten into BCPL and running on that research machine was, was rather painful. Uh, debugging it was hard. As a matter of fact, I lost sort of uh, half of my hair in the process of debugging that program. But um, there were some real advantages. The simulator ran fast, very fast, so I could get my data. And um, the, the problems with, with BCPL was, was all overcome. They, they were not major. There's no code teams in BCPL, so we added them, things like that. Uh, this led me to some ideas of what was important for a tool 
for work in, in, in systems programming in general, I wanted a tool that provided the support for program organization uh, that Simula provided, the help to thinking, the help to design that Simula provided. On the other hand, I wanted something that ran really fast when it had to, like BCPL or C. And that's the main draw for these people who are C++ mavens. If you have to have the fastest, fastest, that's, you know, AI stuff and getting the most massive amount of CPU cycles out of it. Yeah, you're going to have to use something like C or C++. But I wouldn't make the main application out of it. Just the parts that need to be this to be efficient. Yes, not the whole application. The whole application does not have to be written in this. You can use libraries, and that's how they that's how they do it on these devices. On the the stuff that needs to run super fast, super fast, C plus plus Java is written in C plus plus. Likely, I don't think they use C. So you know that's what the, that's what's going on. I wanted something that was easy to port, something that required. Uh, not very much support from the environment. Right, so that's why he's piggybacking on top of C, because you target C as the language, and then you, and all the compilers and all the things out there, you can just use that, which is very clever, very clever. Uh, and uh, preferably something that was available. These interoperability, yeah, because you could just got you're just piggybacking all that, all that, all that work. It's super smart. These ideas later uh, came came in handy when. I found myself uh, involved in, in studying some things at uh, Bell Labs uh, a little bit later. Um, there I developed a language which was initially called C with classes. See? Called it C with classes. That was it. That's basically what it is. That's the way you should have stuck. You should have stuck with that name. That would have, that would have actually reduced the ma massively amount of confusion, sir. Which uh, was meant to deliver the help for design and thinking and program organization from from Simula, uh, but with the uh, efficiency and flexibility of, uh, of C. Uh, there's uh, two questions that, that are often asked about C with classes and later with C++. The first is, is why C, and the other one is, is, is why the, the Simula like classes. Um, I chose C primarily because it was the best systems programming language available. Uh, C is flexible. It, you can do anything you like with it. It's efficient if you know how to. Yeah, it's basically just assembly. To use it, and it's portable. Uh, yeah, efficient. Because it's just basically just assembly shorthand and portable. Yeah, they, everyone has a compiler for it already because it blew up. Uh, in a, in a it's way so much better than <laughs> so much better than assembler. Holy moly! Of a way, it's available on most machines, and um, quite importantly, it's known to most people in this area. If you want to build a new language, a new system, uh, it's quite useful not to have to uh, reinvent every wheel. Um, so I took the edit. Create an abstraction on top of something else. This is how the whole thing's been going the whole time. Shoot that uh, computation as such was a problem solved by Dennis Ritchie in the design of C, and uh, my business was program organization. Uh, exactly. Exactly. That's the, that's the whole thing. It's like we're now we're like kind of getting off away from the hardware. The hardware, although interesting, is not no longer the issue as these things, these programs get really big. It's now like how do we organize this thing but not lose our freaking hair? <laughs> by Dennis Ritchie in the design of C, and uh, my business was program organization. Uh, clearly, C is not the most beautiful language ever. There's a lot of... No, but compared to assembly, hell yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, flaws, but they're second order flaws. Uh, I consider the C declarative syntax an experiment that failed, but it's not critical. I've never met any uh, halfway competent programmer that couldn't uh, master what they needed to master about uh, the C syntax in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. The only thing that, that, that really uh, bothered me and had something to do with the way you write programs was the uh, weak type system of C. And um, I therefore proceeded to improve the static type checking in, in C. So C++ is... Right. So that was the whole thing. Like, if you're going to call a, 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 a subroutine or a function that is expecting two integers, C will let you pass a float in there or a character or whatever. They don't care. And that's awesome in one way and not so awesome in others. And, you know, they add a little bit of type checking eventually, which just see you may wear, wear friendly with that stuff. But in the early days, it's like, hey, this is way better than assembly, so quit complaining. <laughs> They're strongly typed. Uh, classes came in as the primary mean of program organization. The idea being that you organize your programs by looking at the application area. You look for the fundamental concepts in an application area and you try to map them into the program in the form of classes, that is user-defined types. 
and you use a static type chain. A class is a type, a type is a class, a struct is a class with function pointers. That's the big thing. Ooh, a class. Ooh, it's just a struct with the function pointers to the functions that the that it works on for that. Okay. Checking to check that you have used the user-defined types according to the rules that you can derive from what All right, so if you're passing an int to some function that expects an int because you said it does it says hey, hey you're not passing an int here you're passing a float or a character or some string or some list because yeah you might want to check you want to check that instead of blowing up at runtime <laughs> i would see it was just like oh yeah we'll pass a float in there oh yeah. <laughs> what fits with the concept i note that reuse was not a primary aim of mine. Exactly. So this this phrase, he had to say this back then because people lost their minds. Managers lost their minds because they had so many different programs running all over the place in C, right? They're doing all kinds of different crazy stuff. And some pieces of that thing were useful. And that thing was over there, useful. That thing was over there. And they weren't trying to find a way where they could combine these things together. And so for some reason, I don't know exactly the reason, but for some reason, they all lost their minds about this idea about reusing code. It was major hype factor, like the microservices, like uh, all the NFT stuff, Bitcoin, the whole thing. It, it was a major, major hype cycle about reusing code because these guys had generated so much code and so many things from everyone reinventing the wheel. They were like, we have to have a way to put these together. And they saw these libraries being put together. And like, how can we, use, can we use this OOP, this inheritance? Can I just draw from that? You know, can I just make your, can I just call it your thing and then just change it a little bit? It's like, yeah, you can. It's like, oh, wow. So we could do that with all this. It's like, eh, if it's designed for that, I guess. And they're like, we, you said yes. There's a chance. <laughs> they just lost their minds about it they freaking it was crazy i was like and i would look at some of these invitations what they were talking about I'm like this is not really code reuse this is something else this i don't think you could, you're not really they're just shoving all this stuff, stuff in this thing you're like we make it work reuse all that work <laughs> we don't put it all to waste use it one time and get rid of so this is why he's bringing this up um, there's a lot of talk about object-oriented programming and, and, and reuse, and reuse is something you get. See, he said it right there, a lot of talk. For this guy to pick up on like, hey, your term OOP is kind of being abused, man. Like people are trying to think they can reuse other stuff and like, or they're, they're just, you haven't explained it well enough, or you're kind of just riding, maybe riding along with it and letting it kind of just, okay, as long as you're talking about my language and you're going to adopt it. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of ego, ego. If you, okay, we just want to just want to say, language designers have a little bit of ego, a tiny little bit of ego. They really, 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 really want you to see it their way. Really, 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 really. <laughs> if you have a set of well worked out concepts, well presented, represented in your program, then you can reuse those classes, those collections of classes. So what he's saying there is in the simulation land, which he lives in, he lives in simulation land. He's simulating real world stuff, traffic, hospitals, you know, like interactions of molecules. Who knows? Interactions of switching equipment in Bell Labs, like how they do route all this stuff together for the phone calls and data networks. That's his land. OK, so when he's talking about stuff, it's not the general case, which people assumed at the time. That's what he was talking about. It's like, no. The specific case of simulating this stuff and doing it in this particular way, in this particular fashion. And for this, now it happens to be there's lots of things that are useful because simulator was a language. There were people were doing simulations of all kinds of crazy stuff. But it's not something that comes uh, magically from language features. It's something. So these guys, these guys are saying. What he's saying is it's not going to come from the use of my language. I'm not going to be able to fix your organizational problems and how you set your programs up in a general way, unless it's kind of like, can it fit in this paradigm of a simulation? 
Other than that, you're going to have to figure out stuff out on your own. And these language constructs of class and types, and well, it's not going to help you if you don't really know how to break the problem down and haven't, bro haven't done that part yet. We're not going to solve your complexity issues with this. This will help it in certain categories if you think in this certain way, but not always. And people just went, well, they lost it. So they were already doing this procedural stuff in C and they're like, oh, I can just throw these into a class bag of methods and then just pass the data in like I was using those functions. Okay, that was the static thing and major mistake, hugely not up to grade. It's just basically procedural with this inner layers of objects in the middle. It's like, what are you guys doing? Let's, let me keep going. Collections of classes. Uh, it's not something that right, comes then you can reuse a set of well worked out concepts well present uh, represented in your program then you can reuse those classes or those collections of classes right like a simulation you already know everything in there so you can just use them in the simulation okay uh, it's not something that comes uh, magically from language features it's something that comes from thinking clearly about issues getting useful concepts isolated and represented clearly and that is actual software development. That whole organizational of how you put set things up, that is it. That's all of it. And he just said it right there. As much as he would not, likes to not would like to not say that, he would like to would say his language solves all your problems. All you have to do is use objects and classes and types and do strict type based type checking and blah 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 blah. No, but that's what the managers heard, and that's what the hype cycle was around C at the time. That was the conferences. I was like. So you're saying it's going to solve all my problems. So the people heard this and they extrapolated it out. It's like, oh, it's going to solve all my problems, right? And he didn't say that. He didn't say that. But that's what people heard because they were just so desperate for literally anything else other than just C. Desperate. There were other things going on, but they were terrible. So this C++ was the first one that kind of got a foothold and was like somewhat thought through and it did enable like graphics programs and things like that because it kind of fits in that paradigm we're simulating graph you know objects on some piece of paper okay that's easy but in the general case and then people like took it and they were doing procedural and they just applied procedural stuff into this it was a mess um i developed cv classes and, and later c plus plus in the computer science research center at bell labs in murray hill that's in new jersey in the united states really and um, I think my work environment there was of, of great importance um, in the sense that uh, a, a language will reflect the environment in which it is uh, created and the kind of uses uh, that it's put to in that sense. Exactly. Exactly. It was not general purpose that everybody used this for everything. It was specific purpose at Bell Labs to simulate this kind of crazy network stuff. The language is, is like any other big system. Um, the work in those days were a bit of everything. Um, lots of different kinds of works done in the labs. Simulation. And, um, my main job was not to design programming languages. It was to, to get some work done. My work had a lot to do with simulations of things to do with distribution. Right. Stuff he wanted to do. And he just wanted to get some attention for stuff people started paying attention to. And he's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All that time and effort. Oh, yeah, it's paying off now. And people just took it way too far. It's systems. So a lot of the input to the design of CV classes and later C++ came from people dealing with systems programming, dealing with distributed systems, dealing with uh, design of networks, dealing with design, with layouts of uh, VSI and boards, things like that. So the plus plus means it's like one increment up. So the plus plus operator, this is the computer stuff, computer nerd stuff, the plus plus means increment one. So it's C, instead of calling it D, he was like C, a little extra. So he kind of named it properly, but then he started going this OOP thing. It's like, dude, stop with the OOP thing. It's not. You're COP. You're class-oriented programming. You're not objects. And this making objects, yes, of those out of those classes. But those objects can't change. They're locked in. That. Um, I mean, the variables can change, but the functions can't. There was a lot of emphasis on doing things that was uh, useful to uh, call. Yes. So he totally tailored it for this specific thing that he was doing. Colleagues, in general, uh, useful to other people around. Uh, on the other hand, there was a freedom for, for deadlines. Nobody was telling me when I had to deliver the next release. And very importantly, uh, there was a freedom for 
from feds and I don't know about that. I'm th I think he actually kind of took advantage of a fad. This is a little bit covering his butt a little bit. He definitely, for naming it OOP, he definitely was taking advantage of a fad. Now stop. And uh, commercialism. I didn't have to. And commercialism? Stuff, Are you for... kidding me? Dude. The C++ was the first one that was the ultra commercialized of all of the languages. This, Pascal tried a little bit, but this one, I mean, Basic got it on its own, and people were waiting for the next one after Basic. And this was, this was the next one. And people went crazy on the hype wave. Be Again, because people were so desperate dealing with C and these other procedural languages. They were just losing their minds in mutable shared state. They were just like, they were trying to find anything to deal with the complexity. And this is the next thing. From feds and uh, commercialism. Bullshit. I didn't have to produce something uh, that could sell, uh, that fitted nicely on glossy uh, brochures. And I didn't have to produce something that would please uh, academic reviewers keen on, on the latest intellectual fads. But that's what happened. Oh, I want that to happen. But that's what happened. You co-opted some words, you took other people's stuff. You didn't really give credit. So that's what happened. But that's not what he wanted to do. No, no, of course not. <laughs> I, he would never stoop so low as to do that. <laughs> not me. No, no. I am above it. I'm in the airy space. Above it in AT&T land. Just doing a simple little language for my peers. Focus directly on the programmers uh, writing production code, not on uh, advertising um, managers or... Um, sort of the guardians of uh, academic fashion. Right, because Bell knew from the experience they had just been having with Kernahan and Ritchie, making extremely st strides at taking their hardware that they already had and make it a hundred times more efficient. They knew they keep their shit, keep their hands off and let the nerds go to town. That's why, because they knew they had a cash cow on their hands. All they had to do was shut up and let him go. So Bell had that. They knew that at the time. They have like lost it eventually, but you know, at, the, at this moment in its history, this is what they're doing. And that's the agile. Sorry, you gotta let the nerds go, man. They kind of know some stuff. So benefits and, you know, there was good stuff and bad stuff about all this, right? And I'm gonna, you know, call it the bad stuff because usually people don't, and I don't know why. Because this is this 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 stuff is kind of annoying because we're dealing with it today with the confusion and the hype cycles and all that stuff. Still, and it's difficult to talk to people because they don't know all this stuff. Uh, C with uh, classes was a medium success, and that that turned out to be a problem. A medium success is something that uh, is clearly uh, a help to a lot of people, but not enough help to pay for an infrastructure. Oh, we're gonna pay for stuff now. I thought it wasn't for commercial success stuff. You just said that two seconds ago. This guy. <laughs> this guy is so funny. Let's keep going. Let's see what else he's got to do. It's like, you can't have a medium successful language now. We got to push this thing. I, we have to have an infrastructure. <laughs> this guy. In other words, somebody who produces a medium design uh, will end up supporting it forever. So I was the support and uh, development uh, organization for CVIL classes, and I would uh, keep on being that for a long time. Um, since, since I wasn't too- You did it with C++, who cares, whatever. Come on, stop. Too keen on, on, on doing maintenance and uh, hotline support for the rest of my life, I was looking for a way of uh, getting out of the dilemma. And uh, there seemed to me to be exactly two ways out of the dilemma. I could either improve uh, the language so that it could uh, provide more benefits to the users, uh, allow people to write code better, make greater changes to their organizations. Um, that would make the language more organization of their code popular, would uh, get more users, and that would allow to pay for the uh, infrastructure that it needed, supports development, teaching. But we didn't do it for money, right? Right. Uh, compilers, porting, that kind of stuff. And the alternative was, of course, to stop supporting CVIL classes, and then um, the users would go away, and that would, would solve the problem. And we couldn't have that now, could we? So we're going to go ahead and co-op some ideas, maybe not explain things very well, create an industry out of some vague, 
how not, this is really general purpose. But he was like, I am so sick of supporting this thing all by my lonesome. Either we're going to get somebody in on it or I'm going to let it die. And he's just like, I'm not going to let it die. I'm going to do, to make it confusing so we can get people into the circuit. I'm going to overpromise, underdeliver, hype it up like crazy. Get all the people on the on the conference circuit and the and the book circuit to write all these books, implementing his ideas poorly, explaining them poorly, and then having loads of people all hyped up from the juice on the like, excitement of the pumped up C plus plus C plus plus bandwagon that's going to solve other problems and they go jump in just writing procedural stuff that's methods in a name namespace bags bags of methods great so what's a, okay what's the difference it's just okay so you now have code has names the sections of code has names now and they're all just passing data back and forth like in the procedural does it it was a mess. It's like, no, I'm not doing procedure. I'm doing C++, but you're passing around values to the functions. What is that different than than, meth, than uh, doing procedural when you're just passing data to functions? It's different than C++. Oh my God, people would lose their minds. Like, you, okay, you have to be careful, right? Be sure you understand what you're talking about. People would lose their minds when I brought that stuff up. And it'd be super frustrating working on some project. That's kind of one of the reasons I took a little break for a while. Because I was like, okay, I need to go like, <laughs> stop doing this for a minute. Go look into what the hell they're talking about. And come back when I have a better sense of going on. Because pe the, the social, some people need to get some more social skills. Instead of admitting you don't know what I'm talking about. Or you can't, or you don't have, a, you you're like, instead of just assuming you know what I'm talking about, how about like ask some questions, please. And don't be a dick about it. How about that? Don't be a dick about it. <laughs> this stuff is ridiculous. I'm being a dick about it because I was over this stuff. I'm over these kinds of people saying, we got to do it my way and it's impossible. We're going to solve all your problems and then putting out hype cycles. That then you have to come back and go, hey, wait a second. You're just talking about functions with pointer. You're talking about a, a struct with pointers. Is that what we're talking about? And putting things in, you know, enclosing things and hiding things from each other. Okay, we let's treat let's back up from the hype for two seconds, please. Um, on the other hand, the users were my friends, and just uh, dropping them that didn't, didn't didn't seem to be fair at all. So, okay, that's that's honorable. Um, I later learned that. That actually was a, uh, a third alternative, but I'm somewhat uh, pleased that I didn't think of it at the time. Because the third alternative, which is sort of a conventional solution, is uh, simply to add hype. More advertising, more glosses, talk people into using it. Um, and that's what happened. So I don't know what he's talking about, but that's what happened. They overplayed what this thing can do. They said it could do things that it couldn't do. It's not cool to do that because you just want your friends to have your language and it won't die. I get it. I understand. This is America. This is how it works. But just realize what we're dealing with. But fortunately, I didn't, didn't think about that at all. Um, when uh, I designed CU classes, some criteria for what uh, was useful uh, developed. Actually, the origin of that goes back to my work with Simula and PCPL. And over the years, uh, it grew into a set of rules of thumb. Um, you could call them principles, but that, that sounds so pretentious. So um, I'll stick with rules of thumb. So that's what people took them as, buddy. And you didn't make that clear when you were talking about that when you first when you first introduced it. So he's trying to do some fixing up here because this is like two years after the hype wave was already involved. Yeah, you didn't you didn't quite explain it that way when you first said it. You said it with these were the paradigms or this is the what was it, what was the word he used. You could call them principles, but that principles. That's how people took them. And they were you could not talk about this stuff. If you were doing C, you had to use his principles, which became dictates. And this is where it always goes sideways. Anytime you guys go to a conference and you get all hyped up about some new technology, and you come back and you're gonna say it's gonna solve all your problems, it's not. It's gonna save the sales guys' problems. That the conference you just went to, who presented that, who presented that information to you, you're gonna solve his problems, getting him a mortgage and a summer home, but he's not gonna solve your problems. 
that that sounds so pretentious so uh. yeah because that's what you are you're a pretentious prick useful great love lo you bring it you bring it you bring it to the ideas out but you also put pooped in the pooped in the <laughs> you pooped in the, in the in the punch bowl at the same time um, i'll stick with rules of thumb uh, first of all c++ is a language it's not a complete system in that it differs from people trying to provide a complete environment. Oh, he's clearing the air now. Oh, now it's not a complete system. Because for a while there, right before this video came out in 94, oh yeah, complete system o -rama. ...environment for programming and use, like it is common in the Lisp or Smalltalk world. Uh, on the other hand, it has the effect that if you, if you work in C++ on a, on, a, on a Unix system, C++ will, sound, will, will feel like a, a Unix language. It will have the user interface that you have on your Unix system. It'll have the libraries you're used to. It'll have the feel of Unix. If, on the other hand, you work on the DOS, it'll feel like a DOS language. So you just talk about the libraries to hook into the system if you're using a C++. If you're writing a C++ application, you're going to be hooking into C++ to the, to the libraries for that OS. Wow. Profound. And um, presumably, you uh, like the, the system you're working on. So that's fine. It also simplifies porting because you only have to port uh, the language. You do not have to port a user interface and operating system. Oh, that's not really what happened either. I mean, they tried to do that. X uh, graphic users. That was not. No, no, no. You had to hook in to the OS, so it's not portable. Sorry. Stop. This is where the reusability stuff comes from. Is this right here? People hear, oh, I can write my application in one place and do it every place else. Sir, you're going back on what you just said. I have a memory. I don't know. Am I the only person paying attention to what he's actually saying? System uh, like thing. The classical distinctions between the language, the environment, and the libraries is ma maintained deliberately. Um, an important rule in the design of C++ as more features were added was what we call the zero hit rule. What you, uh, what you don't use, you don't pay for. So that was the whole thing. That's what makes it not an OOP language. This is what makes it a COP language is this is this thing right here. Zero overhead. That's the whole point. Maximum hardware efficiency. Cutting out OOP things that don't match that. That's COP. We call the zero overhead rule. What you, uh, what you don't use, you don't pay for. Uh, C++ has some semi-advanced features, and they can can be ever so slightly more expensive to use than the uh, simpler features. Right. Okay. It's just juicy. He's just talking about getting that 2%. Back then it was like 6%, but now it's like 1%. And so then it's decreasing over time, unless you're doing the kind of thing where it needs, needs that tiny little edge. And then you want to do it and you'll go learn that and you'll go into it. But in general, applications level, no, you don't get to come, no. But it was very important to us at the time that you should not only be able to write nice programs in C++, you should be able to afford to write nice programs. And uh, for that reason... Right, just be efficient. Okay, gotcha. You should be able to do simple things simply and cheaply. Okay. I'll let you listen to the rest of that video, but um, that is the kind of overview of where I'm coming from in this document. And we're going to get into more of the details of, of the style of programming um, that's just to was dealing with and you know what these what these ideas represent so uh give me a like and subscribe and i appreciate you watching and we'll continue this journey <laughs> of me ranting about stuff i don't like <laughs>